You're watching Frank Talk with me, Frank Rausen Pereira. Before I proceed, let me ask you, have you subscribed to the channel and liked the video? If not, please do so now. We have an informative monthly newsletter. Do subscribe to it. And how can I not tell you about the Bharata First Knowledge Center, our big success story? It is the one-stop destination for all your competitive exams needs. Hundreds are reaping the benefits. Make sure that you are not left behind. We now have 26 courses to address your learning needs, all available at less than 1000 rupees per course as part of our ongoing early bird offer. What's more, the first 100 to register will get a further discount of 10%. So what are you waiting for? Register at kc.bharatavas.com right now and be a part of this amazing way of learning. Don't miss out on this incredible opportunity. All this information along with some must see recommendations are in the description of the video please go through it. Well, India has a grand history of textiles, something that dates back to over 5,000 years. It is an art that we should all be proud of. Unfortunately, there is very little information about this glorious aspect of ours. To talk about the marvel that is Indian textiles, I have with me on Frank Talk, a person who needs no introduction. It is Shefali Vaidya, author and convener in the Academy. Shefali, uh, welcome and very happy to have you here. Thank you so much, Frank. As always, it's a pleasure to come back. And I'm especially happy uh, that you called me for this conversation. I was very keen to speak on Indian textiles. So thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to talk absolutely, to you. Absolutely, absolutely. And you know, the last time around we spoke, we ended on a note where we said that I we will ensure that we will speak about textiles the next time or Indian textiles That's the right. next time that we meet. Yeah, yeah. And here we are today. So let's continue from where we left off. And talking about Indian textiles, you know, uh, where did this love for textiles really start? How did it begin? <laughs> you know, I grew up in a very small village in Goa. And where uh, it wasn't like I was exposed to fashion, but my mom always wore very beautiful handwoven saris. So did my grandmom. So did all the women of that generation, basically. And uh, one of my most favorite memories was uh, when my mom used to tidy up her sari cupboard. And it used to be usually on summer afternoons. And it was a world that only I and my mother inhibited. And uh, when she opened her cupboard and she took out all her saris, and when she folded them back, dusted them, put them back, it was always, you know, every sari came with the story. And she would be half talking to herself and half talking to me. But all the saris would have some memory. She would say, this sari my brothers got for me when they went to Calcutta. This is a Jagdani. This is a sari I inherited from my mother. It is a 80-year-old Banarsi. This is a sari your father got for me when he went to Bombay and he went to this exhibition. So through that, slowly I started uh, this love for textiles. And then when I grew up and I went outside Goa, I saw museums. One of my first experience with the textile museum was actually with the Chhatrapati Shivaji Museum in Bombay. They have a very good textile wing. So when I went to see the textile wing, I was, uh, I think I, I was a postgraduate student by then. And I was really fascinated by the kind of textiles that they had and the way it was displayed, the stories behind it. And I started reading more. I started getting books. I started, uh, you know, going to newspapers. Then later on, when I could, when I had the financial wherewithal, I started traveling to weaving clusters, talking to the weavers and understanding the different techniques behind different weaves started exploring the history of uh, Indian textiles. And I realized that throughout the history of the Indian subcontinent, not just in India, textile is a common theme that has held us together. We have this misconception that textiles is just for clothing, textiles is just for fashion, textiles is just for looking good, but it's not. Textiles are very closely connected with our culture. They're very closely connected with our history. They're very closely connected with our economy even. And to study the history of India through, uh, right when we start from the Sindhu Saraswati days, for example, the one thing that has stayed with us for the past 7,500 years of recorded history, the way we view history as it is not prehistory, 
is a history of indian textiles because when you go through the the stuff that we have found in the sindhu saraswati valley excavations in chaudaro in rakhi gadi in mohenjodaro we find that our ancestors not only knew how to spin yarn from cotton they cultivated cotton they cultivated flax they knew how to spin yarn from it not only that they knew how to color it and most importantly they knew how to use something called a modern which is a medium which is used to fix colors in those days and this is i'm talking about 4500 to 6500 bc so it's like you know about 7500 to 8000 years old from this day and our ancestors knew how to uh, take out color from different roots from different minerals and they knew how to how to dye the fabric and they knew how to fix the color and that fixing the color is the key because it requires very uh, precise scientific knowledge you need to know what are the modern you need to know how much modern you need to use you need to know how, what do you need to do to fix uh, that color and how do we know that because we found scraps of some colored yarn stuck to a silver vase which was found during one of the excavations at chaudar uh, which the originally that british uh, archaeologists had conducted these excavations now clothing is um, is ephemeral it doesn't last too long so we don't have like a a, a, a huge uh, fragment of cloth that has survived uh, 4500 to 5000 years it's not possible but from these threads we know that our ancestors could spin yarn we also found a lot of spindles lot of needles lot of uh, loom uh, parts rudimentary loom parts during the scale same excavations so we knew we know, and these are large number of finds okay these are not one or one needle you found somewhere in somebody's house or one spindle you found in somebody's house no in a single place you found like hundreds of spindle needles hundreds of loom parts so it's very obvious obvious that even in those days there were there was commercial production of cloth there were actually villages where probably weavers stayed and their job was only to weave cloth and to sell it to others because we know that sindhu saraswati civilization was a very 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 uh, very modern civilization they lived largely in urban cities they had well planned cities they had toilets we all know that they also had this economy where there were villages of people who only made jewelry they had villages where people only made cloth and these cloths or uh, these textiles were sold either through barter or money i don't know but definitely there was an exchange of uh, exchange of some sorts and this cloth was sold to the rich people of the cities of mohenjodaro of hadappa or whatever that that much we know so our historical tradition of textiles it's that long and today when you look at history and when you study history you realize that history of india is really the history of indian textiles, textiles. if you look at it that way yeah. yeah absolutely so there was a commercial angle attached to it 7500 years ago there yes. is still a commercial yes. angle attached to it and it is textiles that has kept us <clears throat> together do those traditions continue to exist even today you know with your interactions with the weavers and others i'm sure that you come across some of these small things that they do small things which are magnificent you know it's interesting that you should ask that because uh, one of the very famous finds of the sindhu saraswati civilization excavations mohenjodaro excavations was the priest king that statue lies in a museum in pakistan but everybody knows you google it and you will find it and you will see that it's a statue of a nobleman of a very high uh, priest or a king that's why he's called a priest king and he's wearing a shawl and on that shawl there is a pattern that pattern is called a trefoil pattern some say that that pattern is the starting point of the paisley motif which became identified with india and that motif eventually turned into very stylized paisleys and paisleys again all over india you see paisleys they are known by different names but in every place they are different shaped paisleys for example if you go to kashmir and if you see the paisley motif there the paisley motif there is very sharp very pointed it's almost like the cypress leaves there sycamore leaves there sycamore or cypress i don't remember now but it's like the uh, local tree there and how the leaves are pointy that's how the paisley becomes very stylized very pointy in kashmir but if you go down to south you will still find the paisley in kanchipuram weaves you know these are like two ends kashmir to kanyakumari literally 
So you go to Kashmir and you go to Kanchipuram. In Kanchipuram also you'll find the paisley, but there the paisley is fatter, it's rounder. And it's known as a manga motif because it resembles a mango rather than the cypress leaves, but it is the paisley. And that again, to me, as I start, started studying motifs, that is, we, we, we hear a lot about unity and diversity, right? All through our school days, from third grade, they tell you that India is a great land. We have unity and diversity. This is unity and diversity. You see the same motif. Again, the peacock. You see the peacock on Mohenjo-Dara pottery. You see peacock, you see a pregnant peacock with a baby peacock inside its stomach on the fragments of pottery that uh, people have found during Sindhu Saraswati excavations. And you see the peacock on the back of trucks also today in India, even now in 2021. And you see peacock in jewelry, you see peacock in rangoli, you see peacock in embroidery, you see peacock in leaves. It's the same motif that has stayed with us for so many years and it has undergone, um, I wouldn't say metamorphosis, but it's a motif that has undergone stylistic changes. So, for example, a peacock in a Kanjipuram sari will look very different from a peacock in Kasuti embroidery, which will look very different from a peacock in a Banarsi brocade sari, which will look very different from a peacock in the Patan Padolla sari. But having said that, you take one look at that motif and you'll know it's a peacock. So the peacockness of the peacock has not been touched anywhere. You know that a peacock has to have a body, it has to have an elongated neck, it has to have a beautiful plumage, it has to have long legs, and that is held true in all these places. But every place has tried their own stylistic uh, interventions, and every place has made that peacock look different. So somebody like me who's interested in motives, I can look at a peacock and tell you that this peacock is from this region of India without even, you know, anybody telling me why uh, that this, this, uh, this fabric is from Gujarat or Kanyakumari or Kanchipuram or Banaras. I can make it up because I know how the peacock has been represented. See, that is the unity in diversity. The peacock remains the same. The peacock nests of the peacock remains the same, but there are regional variations. And all the regional variations are so beautiful that together they give you a very nice picture of India. And it is not true just of the peacock. There are so many symbols. The lotus is another one that you find across India. Uh, there, is, uh, there are uh, motives associated with the worship of Vishnu, like the Shankar, Chakra, Gada, Padma, which are also the motives associated with the worship of Buddha. So you find these motives everywhere from temple architecture to literature to dance to paintings, to folk theater, to weaves, to jewelry, to embroidery, to everything. And that to me, as a, as a, as a budding uh, researcher of art history, it's fascinating. And it is not something I have seen anywhere else in the world. Absolutely. So, so there's so much of commonality. Yes. And not only that, to, I don't know if you have been to Ajanta or not. Have you been to Ajanta? I've been, yes. So if you see the cave paintings of Ajanta, there are two very beautiful paintings of uh, Bodhisattvas. One is a Padmapani Bodhisattva, one is a Vajrapani Bodhisattva. And both the Bodhisattvas have a, a, something known as a Kativastra. They have a fabric around their waist. And on that fabric, you have a particular checkerboard motif, which is known as the Pasapalli motif. It's, 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 it's actually inspired by the Ludo game or the checkerboard game, which was invented in India, by the way. So the, the cave paintings of Ajanta date to, they started around 2nd century BC and they continued for the next 600 years. The Buddhas are some of the oldest paintings in Ajanta. And the same pattern, in the same color scheme, in the same way, you see being woven even today in the state of Odisha. Ajanta is in Maharashtra. Odisha is on the East Coast. And you see the same pattern after almost 2,000 years, 2,100 years being woven in the same place even today. So how did the motif travel? In those days, you didn't have the internet, you didn't have the phone, you didn't have WhatsApp that today you click a picture of the motif and say, I want exactly this to be copied. But how did this happen? How did this cultural exchange happen? The cultural exchange happened because we always had a very thriving trade culture so goods from one part of India could travel to another part of India through the two major highways, Uttarapath and Dakshinapath. And that is why every cluster or every place, they specialized in what they were good at. 
so weavers of kanjipuram were very good at doing cotton work extremely good cotton work their cotton sarees were so finely woven that they were called as uh, venti nebula meaning woven wind by the romans they were so fine there were uh, jamdanis woven in what is now bangladesh which were so thin and so translucent that they were known as abarwan meaning running water so that if you held that particular cloth under a stream of water you wouldn't be able to make out that there is a cloth the cloth was so fine it would look like it's water we had that kind of skill so every place developed that kind of fine skill and they said okay we are good at doing this you are good at something like that so we will manufacture at this and we will keep progressing at that you manufacture that and you keep progressing at that till you become the best at that which is what today's market economy is no so one country doesn't produce everything you produce what you are good at or one region doesn't produce everything you produce what you are good at and then you exchange it nowadays you exchange it for money in those days probably they exchanged it initially for barter and then for money i don't know but the fact that we had this thriving economic culture it's it's really fascinating to me as a researcher and as somebody who's really interested in textiles now i talked about textiles were traded across india right but they were not just traded across india they were traded indian textiles were traded abroad even before the start of the common era so one of the earliest mentions of this you find in the chronicles of pliny the elder who was a roman historian who actually laments that indian cloth is so good and so expensive that when it is imported to rome the roman women all want only that cloth and because of that we have to buy it at exorbitant prices and the money is all draining out of rome and it is going to india so he actually said that the indian cloth import should be banned we need to conserve our foreign uh, currency that is why we we should not buy cloth from india because all our women are crazy about indian textiles they were so fine in fact the roman word for uh, cotton is corbasino which is a corruption of karpas which is sanskrit for cotton we were that good and we knew how to weave cloth from cotton we knew how to weave cloth from wool we knew how to weave cloth from tree bark the vulcanum is what is known as was woven from tree bark we knew how to weave cloth from flax and we knew how to weave cloth from wild silk which was known in india by its sanskrit name kosha kosha means a kukur so even today for example in states like jharkhand and chatisgarh where you get this wild silk it is still known as kosa which is a corruption of the sanskrit word kosha because it's wild silk india is the only country in the world which has four different varieties of silk today it has the commercially cultivated mulberry silk it has the tussar or the kosa it has the eri silk and it has the muga the last two are found only in assam and they are very different varieties of silk and muga uh was known as the royal uh, silk because the silk naturally has a golden luster and uh, muga basically uh, it's an heirloom you buy a muga sari it will last you at least for 100 years and with every use with every wash the luster becomes brighter so a uh, 50 60 year old muga sari which has been washed at home maybe 30 40 50 times it actually uh, glistens like gold that is why it is known as it it is known as a silk of light because it looks like light is being woven into a fabric and it's very expensive as you can imagine and nowadays you find it very hard to procure because uh, the jungles are dying and this is primarily a wild silk it's not a cultivated silk eri similarly is something that you find in assam again and eri silk has uh, thermal control properties so for example in very hot summer the fabric keeps you cool and in winters the fabric keeps you warm normally people don't wear silk in summers because silk sticks to your body and it is not a it is not a very summer friendly fabric but eri silk is something that you can wear in summers as well and eri silk is known as ahimsa silk also because the silk is uh, is, is is the yarn uh, the the cocoons are turned into yarn after the cocoons have been broken and the moth has flown away that is eri but we have mulberry we have We have eri, we have munga, and we have tussar. No other country in the world has all four varieties of silk, which are available even today. 
and curiously enough if you read the accounts of foreign travelers like uh, huen sang like marco polo like uh, later on like french traveler tavernier and uh, you map those travel accounts to today's india and you put them against today's weaving clusters you will find that right from the times of marco polo and huen sang the weaving clusters that he has mentioned they still exist the number of weavers has reduced but the weaving clusters still exist in the same places for example huen sang mentions that in banaras they used to wear a weave very fine brocade it is still being woven there he mentions that in kanchipuram there used to be very fine cotton weaving there is still a huge weaving cluster in kanchipuram so even today all these places you can still map so you can see that despite so many disruptions despite so many rulers changing despite the political uh, upheavals the craft has survived in india i will not say it has thrived because we all know what the british did to indian weavers and i'll talk about it in a bit but it has survived it is and how has it been surviving it has not been surviving through schools and universities it has simply been surviving because it is a civilizational memory it is a civilizational knowledge that has been passed down from father to son from mother to daughter and even today even after so many disruptions even after so many changes weaving is still the sector handloom is still the sector which employs the second largest number of people in india after agriculture because weaving employs entire households it's not just the weaver there are people who are spinning the yarn there are people who are setting up the loom there are people who are finishing the finished products and all of this is done by the family members of the weaver so today we talk a lot about work life balance and stuff like that right so our weavers already have that work life balance because they have other things to do also so if you go to odisha for example you will find that many weavers also have uh, their own land they till their own land so there are specific months in a year where they will work in the fields then during the monsoons where you cannot really work in the fields and you do you know you have a lot of time on your hands then you sit in the home and you do weaving so and even when you are doing the weaving it's like both men and women weave so they weave uh, in the morning for 3 hours then they have lunch then they have a nice siesta where it's very hot then in the evening they'll again weave then somebody will come home they'll talk they'll socialize and weave so their muscle memory is so high that even when they have guests and i've seen this i've gone to many weaving clusters and spoken to weavers and half the time they're working and they're still talking to you they don't need to constantly look at what they're weaving it's just that their minds and their their body mind are working in such perfect coordination that they can talk to you and still weave so there was a lady uh, called kalabati meher she is a national award uh, winner winning weaver she is based in a small village called barpalli in uh, odisha she is a very very skilled ikat weaver so uh, you know that when you weave ikat the process is twofold first of all you have to tie and dye the yarn and then you weave the tie and dye yarn now the tie and dyeing process is very complicated and that is why it cannot be replicated by machine so far so what the weavers do is they set up looms on a wooden frame and they mark the loom the the yarn with the design and then they painstakingly tie the yarn with thread and then after that when they've got the entire pattern tied then they dye the yarn with the thread on then after dyeing they unravel the threads so the part that is covered by the thread doesn't take color so that's how the design emerges later on so once this yarn is uh, tied and dyed then they weave it so it's a very precise uh, art and if you make mistakes during the tie and dyeing part then your whole fabric will go for a toss mm. but this woman has been doing this since she was 14 years old she learned it from her parents so when i went to her place she was sitting there on the frame and she was doing her tie and dye and she was talking to me in between she went inside made tea brought tea offered me tea again talked and all this while her work was going and then suddenly her grandson came she was doing her work on the frame and the grandson came and you know held on to her legs and stood up and even while working she talked to the grandson so all this was happening in a very uh, very inclusive way this is the perfect work life balance and uh, she was content being where she was obviously she is a very well known weaver so she was doing quite well 
and because of that she was very happy to be in her home to be in her familiar surroundings creating this ex- exquisite work of art and it is a work of art and even the weavers know it because they perform their act of weaving as an auspicious act it is not just a job for them so there are specific rituals before you start a sari they every uh, dashara they worship their looms they do a puja in odisha there is one more day in a year where uh, they make stray uh, uh, sorry straw horses they fashion horses out of straw and they offer it to the loom and then afterwards those uh, horses are given to the children of the village and then the children go from house to house with the procession of those horses this is basically meant to show respect to the loom because the loom is viewed as lakshmi and the loom provides prosperity so the loom loom should be treated with respect the weaver treats the loom like a god even though it's an inanim- inanimate object this is again a very very indian thing this you will not find anywhere and even when they sell the products they sell it with the fact that i have put my heart and soul into weaving this so when this article of clothing is being offered to you i hope that it will bring you happiness it will bring you auspiciousness it will bring you joy that is the prayer that the weaver is supposed to do when he is supposed to take the finished product off the loom and you will still find that in say kanchipuram so kanchipuram many of the weavers uh, people go there for their wedding shopping you know the the big ticket shopping so weavers and even shops will often have a temple inside their store and when the products have been selected then they will call the bride and groom whose wedding it is and they will perform a small puja in front of the temple where they will uh, put the cloth that's been selected for the wedding ceremony and they will actually pray that uh, this is a cloth that i have woven with a lot of love and with a lot of uh, happiness and i hope that when you wear it on your wedding day it brings you also joy and happiness it's a very touching ritual actually and it's not a transactional uh, uh what it's not just a mere transaction it's not just a mere business transaction that you go to gap you like something you try it on you buy it and end of the story no it's a relationship and because of that traditionally like all our economic uh, transactions this is also a relationship based transaction so that is why people have stores like for generations just like we have jewelers even today many indians for weddings when they make jewelry they do not just go to a big branded store now they have started in cities but in rural india or semi rural india they will still go to their family jeweler this family jeweler family sari shop family cloth shop is a tradition that is still continuing in india it is continuing because even the shop has evolved and even the customers have evolved there are places where the shopkeeper has seen three generations of a particular family he has seen them get married he has seen the couple have children he has seen the couples get uh, the children get married and every point of time the shopping has been from that shop or that weaver because that is a relationship people have had that is again something very unique to indian culture so that is why i am saying that the story of indian textiles is really the story of india it is the first make in india project today we talk a lot about be vocal for local make in india but this is one product that has been with her with us with india since the dawn of our civilization and it has been there it is like the mighty river ganga it has changed but yet it remains the same and it has continued flowing through thousands of years and which is something that is is hugely remarkable and it is not something that you see in other cultures you will still see it in some stray pockets in say south american countries you will see it in southeast asia a lot the same tradition of weaving but that also because it has totally gone from india so all the the patterns the designs the color schemes the techniques everything has gone from india to countries like thailand to countries like cambodia to countries like indonesia to countries like vietnam and even today the kind of stuff that they weave is very reminiscent of the stuff that india wove in earlier days so fascinating now i'll now it's i'll so come to the point yeah. it please, is please now i'll ahead. come to the point now i'll come to the tragic story which is not been talked about enough it's been documented yes but it's not been talked about enough is how india at one point of time ruled manufacturing in the world so in the 17th century and in the first half of the 18th century 
India accounted for more than 65% of world's manufacturing. 65% of the goods that were sold in the rest of the world were manufactured in India. And out of them, most, the biggest chunk was taken by uh, spices and processed spices and textiles. And all the looms, we had such fabulous designs, we had such fabulous colors, we had such fabulous techniques that all the foreign visitors who would come to India would get completely amazed. Tavernier, who was a French uh, jeweler who came to India in search of jewelry, in search of trading, he has mentioned he was a, he was a man with very keen aesthetic sense and he appreciated beauty wherever he saw. So he's made very minute notes about what he saw in India in terms of arts and craft. And he has said that all through when he was coming from France to India, almost everyone he met along the way was clothed in textiles made in India, everywhere, from, the, from Europe to the Middle East to Southeast Asia, everywhere. Most of the well-off people, they wore clothes or textiles that were woven in India. So India clothed the world till 1850. And because of that, in fact, one of the major reasons why the East India Company, as well as the Dutch East India Company, came to India was A, to get spices, but B, also to take away textiles into their countries. And they, Indian textiles were hugely popular. You must have heard about a textile called chintz, which was that floral, it, the word chintz come from Hindi cheat, which is like speckled or spotted cloth because those cloths had, uh, that textile had those minute designs. And those uh, textiles were a huge rage in England. Everybody wanted chintz armchair. Everybody wanted chintz clothing, curtains, everything. So the British were not very happy with it. They were, uh, they liked the Indian textile patterns, but they didn't like the fact that Indians had the technology, Indians had the wherewithal of producing something which was so good. And that's how uh, the textile mills and the power loom industry happened in the suburbs of, uh, in Manchester, in UK. And when they started uh, printing power loom textiles with the same designs that they had stolen from India, by the way. So they used the same colors, they used the same motifs, they used the same patterns, and they replicated them in UK at a fraction of the cost because they were using power loom. These were not as high quality, these were not as fine textiles as India or Indian weavers could make, but they looked roughly the same and they were much, much, much cheaper. And then they started dumping this cloth into India that we have all learned in our school history. So they started buying cheap raw material from India. They started buying cotton, jute, taking it to Manchester, turning it into power loom cloth, and they started dumping finished cloth in India. So this affected the Indian weavers in two ways. One, they could not get the raw material. So they had to pay higher prices for the raw material because all the raw material was being exported to England. And secondly, when they paid higher prices for the raw material and they made this cloth, their cloth wouldn't find takers because their cloth was expensive. And you would find a similar looking cloth made, made in England and being dumped in India. It's kind of like what is happening with made in China clothing today or made in Bangladesh clothing today, which are much cheaper. They look same, but they're much cheaper. And that is why they are, uh, they are, uh, they are basically cutting into the business of Indian weavers, which is what happened after 1850. So in the beginning of uh, the 19th century, India still exported a huge amount of textiles to the world. By the end of the 19th century, by 1870, 1880, 1890, that share had dropped from say 40% to 5% or 10%. And Indian weavers were literally dying of starvation. And this has been said by a British Viceroy himself. I forget his name right now. But he, he said that the fields of India are being bleached by the bones of Indian weavers. Bentik, I think. Yeah, Bentik. So this was the statement of a British Viceroy in India. That is how the British killed or tried to kill weaving. But weaving still survived. But not enough is being talked about the millions of weavers who either left the profession or who just died of starvation. This is a story nobody tells you. This is not a story that 
people uh, write, make movies about. This is not a story that uh, is immortalized in any novels. But it is no less of a genocide than, say, what the Great Famine claimed uh, in India under the British rule. And these are these are crimes against humanity, really, and not enough is being said about it. Which is why later on in the 1920s, when Gandhi uh, became a very powerful uh, political figure in India, one of the most identifiable symbols he used for the freedom struggle was cloth, was khadi. Because he realized what the British were doing, that they were dumping machine-made cloth in India and they were basically killing Indian enterprise and they were pushing generations of Indians into abject poverty. So that's when he started this thing that I am not going to use uh, anything that's made. Videsi kapra nahi use karenge. We will not use any article of clothing that is made outside of India. And we will wear only hand spun and hand woven cloth, which is what khadi or khadar is. And that is how, again, the Indian textile once again became a very powerful symbol of India's emancipation and India's political future. So that is how textiles have been holding us together from the Sindhu Saraswati civilization till today. What an amazing, amazing story. It's incredible, fascinating, and so wonderful to hear. And I really hope at some point in time, someone actually takes forward the message that you just brought, you know, Shifali, about how it is nothing but genocide. You know, those stories need to be told and those stories yes. need to be told powerfully. And I hope that happens sometime sooner rather than later. But, uh, you know, talking about another aspect, you mentioned about uh, Bangladeshi textiles and, you know, Chinese textiles. And does it become difficult for us to, you know, match up to that? That is one. Secondly, of course, what is being done to try and revive this craft or, you know, or give them more heft, if, if I can use that word? Uh, that's a very good question, actually. Uh, see, handloom, by definition, is a slow and sustainable craft because there is no way that a human being can weave like meters and meters of clothing, which a power loom factory in China can churn out 400 saris at the end of two days. But a, a handloom weaver will take four days to just weave one basic sari, not very complicated stuff also. But what handloom has is the advantage of uh, creating something so intricate that a machine can never replicate it. So a machine can never replicate fine jamdani. A machine can never replicate fine ikat. A machine can never replicate the softness of a, a handloom towel. Even though the machine will give you cheaper towels, but if you use a handloom towel, and even today, there are many weavers in India who use, who weave handloom towels or handloom bed sheets. And if you start using them, you will realize what is the difference between something that's woven by hand and uh, something that's woven by uh, machine. Unfortunately, we as a society have turned out to be uh, this and with increasing prosperity. Ideally, we should be patronizing more and more our traditional weavers and supporting this craft. But with the coming of prosperity, we have joined the use and throw brigade with a vengeance. So every, in, in a city like Bombay or in places like, in most places in India, you don't have seasonal collections. You cannot have seasonal collections, right? Bombay really has two seasons. You have rainy season and you have non-rainy season. That's it. But you see stores in Bombay now who show fall collection, winter collection summer collection, spring collection. And I see these uh, celebrities posting on their Instagram, leather boots in Bombay and wearing leather uh, trench coats in Mumbai. And I was like, you know, see the weather. You'll die if you move out of the AC for even 10 minutes wearing knee-high leather boots in weather like Bombay. How does it even work? This, this uh, fashion is not practical for us, but we're still doing it. And next year, again, winter, they will come up with some other style of boots. So people will junk these existing boots and will go in for new boots. Whereas our saris were like, if you remember our parents' generation, they had saris that they wore for their wedding. And the same sari 70 years later was bequeathed to the daughter and the granddaughter. So we, we treasured our old. We treasured that 
and even now i have for my wedding i wore my grandmother's saree which was at that point of time close to 90 years old now it's more than 100 years old but for me it was a matter of great pride because that it it that saree carries a lot of memories the saree carries a lot of love the saree carries uh uh how do you say a capital of many lives that were lived and their lives were interwoven with that textile so that is something that's not just me that's how indians perceived textiles that is why in all our rituals in all our pujas also one of the main thing is about exchanging new clothes even today you have any festival any religion which is basically in the, in nature you will the first thing you will buy you will do is buy new clothes for your festival and uh, in most places the the new cloth or new sari or new whatever is brought is offered to the divine and then worn for the festival this is something this is a tradition that we have carried in we have even colors that are favored by different deities so lord ganesha is uh, supposed to prefer red so you offer only red flowers or red clothing to him whereas shiva prefers white because he is a yogi he is a he meditates so you offer uh, white cloth to shiva and you wear on on specific days like shivratri and all you are supposed to wear white so this kind of symbolism has been there with us for so many years and that is how our textiles had become such an integral part of our lives secondly we only talk about textiles in terms of clothing but indian textiles have multiple uses like all the palaces and all the buildings they used to have and we didn't have fixed furniture our furniture used to be mainly low sitting right so for that you needed mattresses for mattresses you needed covers you needed bolster covers you needed tents you needed uh, uh, wall hangings to be hung behind the tents and all of this they basically gave work to weavers and embroiderers now that is not happening so now we have moved to uh, a whole new lifestyle which uh, where textiles are mainly about what you wear you know like your your everyday clothes but the use of textiles in other things is is not as high as it was there once upon day even animals used to have uh, uh, some kind of decorated clothing like bulls like camels like horses they all had those jewels even now you get them in gujarat some old pieces are for sale there is exquisite embroidery on them that is being worn on the bullocks nobody is going to notice it also but people have spent months creating a work of art now that is dying out because we are moving increasingly to a utilitarian world and in the utilitarian world obviously economy of scale matters and obviously people uh, where you have sweatshops places like china or bangladesh have an unfair advantage compared to our weavers who still stick to the traditional uh, way of weaving and that is why indian textile industry employs so many people but even then our uh, export is even uh, less than uh, 10% of the global textile export it is very sad actually and that is something that needs to be addressed uh what the government is doing to help the weavers quite a lot actually there are a lot of schemes about subsidies and every state has a separate department which looks after the weavers in that state and they are supposed to have a lot of uh, financial schemes so every time a weaver wants to upgrade his loom or set up a new loom the government uh, pays him a fixed amount as subsidy many of them have dedicated showrooms where these products are sold at a 30% subsidy so the weaver gets a 30% from the government and the consumer gets that uh, particular uh, sari or that particular uh, textile article of textile at a 30% discount so it's a win win for everybody but that is not the way forward subsidies can only uh, sort of you know prop up a dying industry in order to uh, the, for the industry to thrive it has to go into private hands private sector has to come into a big way into patronizing handlooms and most importantly as consumers all of us need to realize the cultural capital of our textiles and we need to realize that this is something that only we have there are only a handful countries in the world which have hand woven textiles still made and out of them india is the largest one with the greatest variety of different kind of weaves different kind of embroideries different kind of uh, textile arts and this is something that we need to be really proud of and we need to view this as our dharohar as our heritage 
as our cultural capital and we need to understand that it is okay to not and uh, a good sari today cost as much as a torn pair of jeans from zara a good silk sari that's 5.5 meter of clothing which is handmade by a weaver will probably cost 3500 bucks 3500 to 4000 bucks and you go and buy a distressed jeans in the latest uh, fashion trend of zara it will cost you about the same so you need to realize that you know where should your money go i am not saying that don't buy zara at all but i am saying instead of buying a different zara jeans every season those who can should go and buy something handloom and it's a myth that handloom is only about sarees or only about dhotis you get handloom home furnishings exquisite ones you get handloom towels you get handloom bed sheets you get handloom contemporary clothes a lot of indian designers are using in handloom textiles handloom yardage with western silhouettes and creating exquisite garments which can be worn by everybody you have uh, amazing rugs you have amazing darees and all of these are woven on the handloom all of these are our cultural capital so we also need to understand that and secondly uh, some corporates have already made a move towards this like for example the tata group has started a showroom called tanera which only sells handloom sarees it's quite a game changer actually the billa group has also a similar concept so more and more private players need to invest into this they need to where the weavers lack today uh, in most of the weaving clusters is a uh, lack of new design ideas because all the designers are in urban centers they are all in your nids or in your big cities working for big fashion retailers and the producers of the textiles that's the actual weavers are sitting in some village far away from the city so that gap needs to be bridged and there has to be some kind of a give and take between uh, the top designers of india and the weavers and there can be design interventions there can be computerized design interventions there are uh, weaver service centers which are under the ministry of textiles uh, at the center which do a lot of this work but they need to be more proactive and a lot of younger weavers they don't need training in weaving mm. they need training in soft skills they need training in how to market their wear they need training on how to make their designs more contemporary they need training on e-commerce they need training on how to you know market their business on instagram on social media on facebook and how their customers can get in touch with them and how they can send them how they can accept payments using uh, e- using electronic gateways e payments and all of that these are the skills that th- today's weavers need so that has to be sort of bridged and that is how i see the future of indian handloom and secondly at some point of time the low value the mass uh, handloom products like the lungis and the gamchas or whatever they may their use may reduce but it will be compensated by really high value handloom products because that will never be replicated by machines a machine cannot produce a high count jandani period a machine cannot produce an exquisite pattern patola period a machine cannot produce a original uh, hand woven patterny period so the sooner people realize it and the sooner sort of taste develop and we educate ourselves on our own uh, vocabulary our own uh, wealth of cultural motives our own cultural capital i think uh, this industry will also revive right now the picture is not as bright as should it should be and let me be can- candid here but uh, there is certainly a hope for a bright future there's always hope for a bright future and hope is all we have as human beings there's nothing else left very there's true. no hope everything else is lost so hope is something very, that we should true. keep alive and we should be optimistic as well because you know yes. the, it's it's got such a rich heritage such a rich culture you know the the craft has continued for thousands of years so yes. let's just push it a little more and you know as a civil society let's rise up to the occasion and actually try and help Uh, fellow uh, bharatiyas and try to help them come up in life as well and that should be done as a collective like you mentioned and yes. that is what will take us forward absolutely <laughs> shivali vaidya a pleasure having you on the program thank you so much for speaking so candidly about this particular subject that is so close to your heart i got to learn so much today i must confess that textiles is not my expertise or my expert area but i've seen several of those sarees 
that my better half wears and i've seen the intricate work that goes into it as well and i've always been uh, you know fascinated by every, those little prints those small little things that go on you know on a sari and all the other handlooms so it's wonderful to have got you know so much of information about this from you from an expert wonderful having you on the program thank you so much thank for sharing thank you so much and before i go let me once again remind you to like the video subscribe and hit the bell icon we have an informative monthly newsletter ensure that you subscribe to it and let me also tell you about the bharata first knowledge center our big success story it is the one stop destination for all your competitive exams needs hundreds are reaping the benefits make sure that you are not left behind we now have 26 courses to address your learning needs all available at less than 1000 rupees per course as part of our ongoing early bird offer what's more the first 100 to register will get a further discount of 10% so what are you waiting for register at kc.bharatapas.com right now and be a part of this amazing way of learning don't miss out on this opportunity all this information along with some must see recommendations are in the description of the video please go through it that's it from me see you again next time